So this is illustrated by the background here. It's a deviation, right? The network layer should be completely straight and orthogonal, but the reality is a bit different. We will see three topics that are very classical. Fragmentation that we would hope would disappear with IPv6, but since we are not with IPv6, it still is a nightmare. Interworking between IPv6 and IPv4 uh, with NATs and uh, proxy ARP. There would be a zillion of other topics like proxy ARP. So proxy ARP is a typical case of hacks. So you combine things that you should not do. We will see exactly which one. And it doesn't work unless you do a number of assumptions or you multiply a number of hacks to make sure that each of the hacks counter, in fact, the counter if, uh, have a counter effect on the negative effects of one hack. Fragmentation. Uh, we have seen that a bit when we talked about TCP. The internet uses packet switching and all the packets are not the same size. In the very old days, uh, X25, PPP lines over telephone lines, you still use that if you go as a journalist to Syria and you communicate over a satellite link to send your 20 line uh, message, you will use probably packets over lines that are very, very small. You typically do that when the quality is poor. Because when you send a packet, you have to encode it and hope that there are not too many bit errors after all the final encoding and decoding. And if there are too many bit errors, the packet will be discarded. Because I've seen one of the principles of the internet is we deliver to the next thing we deliver a packet to, we deliver only packets that are correct. Because we've digitalized everything, it's only in the analog world that you could accept to have lightly, slightly corrupted data. If you have made everything digital, you want the data to be exactly correct. So if the loss, residual loss probability is not negligible, you want to have small packets, because only the small packets have a chance of going through. At the opposite, when you're doing uh, things like at CERN, you're doing very high performance uh, physics experiments, which are essentially big data experiments, you get huge amounts of data over a wired network that are of very good quality. So your problem now is to have as much throughput as possible. And one of the limits to throughput is the packet handling capabilities of the routers and the switches. Now, if we're talking hundreds of thousands of packets per second to be transferred, the fewer packets there are, the better the thing is. And if the link quality is very good, you want to have packets that are very large. So you have such systems that have extremely large packets of that size, for example. The standard size on the, on the internet is 1500, which is small by today's standard, but is inherited from essentially the performance of Ethernet. Very often we will find slightly smaller sizes, we will we'll see why. But the bad news about that is that there's not like a unique packet size. So it's impossible for an application and for a host to know exactly what is the size of the packets that are being transmitted here. Uh, so we see that here, that uh, um, on a Windows machine, I guess, from the uh, backslash here, uh, on a Windows machine, we, we see several interfaces. One interface is the loopback interface. So the loopback interface has practically infinite packet size because it's not really packetizing anything. Uh, we see a standard Ethernet and wireless interfaces that have uh, 500, 1500 bytes. And we see other interfaces that have smaller uh, packet sizes. Uh, this one is a tunneled IPv6 in IPv4 interface. So we see the packet size on the left. And here we see an, a VPN interface. What is a VPN interface? It is something you use if you're not at TPFL, or if you, you can also use it at TPFL, but the primary intention, if you're at home and you want to access the library, you need an EPFL address. So one way to solve the problem, an intelligent way to solve the problem would be to ask you to log into your, the EPFL system with your Gaspar account. But for some reason, libraries don't do that. So instead, they ask that you have an IP address of EPFL. And the way to do it is to 
use VPN, and a VPN will do something that we will see a bit de in more details perhaps next week, which is using a tunnel. It puts all your IP packets into IP packets that will go to a machine at EPFL, which is called the VPN server. And the machine at EPF EPFL, the VPN server, will send those packets uh, to the final destination, pretending that you are uh, in this machine here. So you will appear to the library as being at EPFL. But the price for, to pay to do that is that your IP packets are put inside IP packets. Now, when you, so when you're at home and you use this interface, your packets, your IP packets, which are the EPFL IP packets with an EPFL IP address, are put inside IP packets plus with some encryption and authentication that costs uh, a good fraction of 100 bytes. Therefore, the usable final packets that you can have are less than 1500 because of all the overhead by these encapsulation layers. We'll see that in more detail uh, next week. So those are different reasons that can cause uh, packet sizes to be different. In the past, when IPv4 was deployed, fragmentation and uh, different packet sizes were very, very frequent because there were a lot of uh, networking was difficult at the beginning. You had to pay huge amounts of money to get a line from A to B. So what people would do is use things like telephone lines with modems that had very small packet sizes. So you had a mixture of very small packet sizes and large packet sizes. Here's an example that could happen. You're at home or in a campus with Ethernet, 1500 uh, byte packet sizes, and you go via a network that has a smaller packet size. Now, when you send a packet, right, uh, uh, this host sends a packet, in principle it's possible for uh, UDP datagram to be larger than the MTU size, but if we ignore that fact, it's easy for this system to know what is its local packet size. It has information on this interface, so the first thing uh, any system should do is never create a packet larger than this. Okay, But that doesn't solve the problem because this packet, sooner or later, will be confronted with a network with a smaller size here. So what happens if this machine sends a packet which is 1400 bytes. So why 1400 is just to make the, uh, the thing rounder. So when this packet is uh, sent here, uh, we'll come about the, it's, we have a problem when the packet arrives at this network. The IP layer says when a packet is too large to be transmitted here, you can fragment it. At least the IPv4 layer says that. In IPv6 we say, In IPv6, we would simply drop the packet. But in IPv4, uh, we don't drop it, and we will do what is called fragmentation. So fragmentation means this packet will be cut by this router, R1, into as many packets as needed by the size here. So the size of packet here is 620. The IPv4 header is 20 bytes. We have 1400 bytes of data plus the 20 bytes of IP header. So the way IP does fragmentation is create four IP packets, each of them with their own valid IP header, and then you break this and you fill the three packets here. All right, we do a break and we look at the details of this fragmentation and their consequences in a few more minutes. What we're trying to understand here is how Fragmentation is handled in the internet, at least with IPv4. What would you do if you, would, if you are a router and you have a packet that's too large and you don't want to drop it and you break it into several packets? And because you're a router, you have no other way to bring that information forward other than making it IP packets. So when you fragment a packet, in reality, what you do, as illustrated here, is you create three packets, and those three packets are standalone packets that might live their own life. In particular, if there are multiple paths in the blue cloud, that might follow different paths here. Of course, at the destination, when you will receive uh, the, those three fragments, 
you have to be able to reassemble them. So you have to have in the header somewhere some information that says uh, how you broke it. Which piece, for example, is the first, which piece is the last. Some other protocols use a fragmentation header, where well, it would be an option. We could have added here another, the IPv4 protocol, for example, if this is a TCP packet, the protocol type is TCP. Instead of that, one option would have been to say, oh, there is a next header or a protocol type, which is a fragmentation protocol, and the uh, uh, header would be here. But this is not the design choice of IP. Instead, IPv4 at least puts all the fields that are necessary for the fragmentation in the IPv4 header. So that explains some of the mysterious numbers that we find in an IPv4 header. In an IPv4 header, there is the length, which is not so mysterious, plus those four fields that are used only for fragmentation. The first one is a packet number identifier. It's an identifier, I said packet number, it's in gray, it's datagram number. When there is fragmentation, people use the difference between packet and datagram. A datagram is the original thing here, when it's broken into pieces, each of the pieces is a packet, but it's not a datagram. Here we have one datagram, one packet. Here we have one datagram, three packets. All those uh, fields are here. So first we put a number. So the number is, uh, in principle, a random or serial number put by the source. What many machines do, they, whenever they create an IP packet, they add this number by one. Usually, the numbering space is one numbering space per destination. So that when at the reception we receive a number of fragments, we can glue together those that have the same packet number. And then we have fields. The first field is just a bit. It's the more fragment flag. It just means it is zero. If it's not more, that means it's the last. So in packet one, now, this fragmentation header is present in every packet because it's part of the IPv4 header. So in the non-fragmented datagram, we have the more fragment flag set to zero because there is not more to come. And in packets 2a and 2b, the more fragment flags is set to one here. Then there is the offset. When I said four, there's only three fields. There is the offset, which is saying the offset of the data with respect to the original block. So you have a block of 400 bytes of data. The first block here has an offset of zero. The second block here has an offset of 600. <laughs> and the last block has an offset of 1,200 here. Now, in order to save a few bits, so you code in principle the number of bytes uh, that are before this one here. Uh, in order to save uh, a number, of, to save three bits, in fact, what you code is this divided by eight, which means that the offset has to be a multiple of eight. So one of the rules is fragmentation. When you fragment this, make sure the length here is always a multiple of eight, and then you code here the offset divided by eight, which is just because the IPv4 header was not so, so large in order to save bits. So those, all those fields now uh, can be used uh, at the reception so when we receive the packet at the final destination, packets might arrive in any order, although most of the time they will arrive in the correct order, but not necessarily always. So it might be, for example, that you start receiving packet 3B. So I receive a packet here. Then the operating system has to read in the header of 3B. We see, oh, there's a more flag fragment flag. It means it's a fragmented packet. I see that also because the offset is 600 or 75 in the value divided by four, by eight. So it is a packet that I know is not the first because the offset is not zero and not the last. And the offset is 600. That means I start building in a buffer a packet and I write at position 601, I write all the data that I received here. When I receive 3C, I have the offset of 1200 that will allow me to write it contiguously just after this one. And now I know that I have a contiguous block of 800 bytes because the offset matches. I know this is the last one. So I know I'm missing things only at the beginning. And I, when I receive the third packet, I know by examining the offsets, I mean, the length of this packet, of the useful part of the packet 600, is exactly the offset of the previous. So I know now I have completed the datagram and I can deliver it to the application. All of this 
is done by the IP layer. So this is transparent to the anything above the IP layer, in particular UDP and TCP don't see this fragmentation. The only way you see the fragmentation is if you do a Wireshark on the interface or on the link and you are able to see the multiple packets here. So the layers above, uh, including the transport layer, will uh, receive this. This is the story for IPv4. IPv6 uh, is the same with a very large difference, the first bullet, routers never fragment. Then you could ask, but who fragments if it's not routers? Well, it can be the source. It can be that a source uh, fragments a packet because uh, it can be that UDP creates a datagram that doesn't fit in one IP packet. If that's the case, all that stuff here would happen at the source. This is authorized with IPv4 and IPv6. Having routers fragment is not authorized with IPv6. Why is that? Well, first, because with IPv6, because it's modern technology, we assume that all links will have a decent packet size. So if you claim that you're an IPv6 device, you must support a packet length of at least that size, 1280 bytes, which is the minimum size that's allowed for the MTU for any IPv6 system. Which means any IPv6 system can always make the assumption that we have this. Now you might wonder, why not 1500? Because with modern systems, nobody delivers packets that are smaller than 1500 bytes. No clue? Well, because of encapsulation, we've seen that when we encapsulate, when you access the VPN, uh, EPFL through a VPN, the IP packets, as they will be visible inside the, VP, the EPFL network, are in fact put into IP packets and encapsulation and uh, authentication and encryption headers that are transported across the internet. So that reduces the useful size of the packets. For IPv6, you can have the same, of course, so you want to have a safety margin, but you're going to have worse, as we will see sometimes when we want to transport IPv6 packet over a part of the world that does not have IPv6 connectivity, we can do the same trick as for the VPN tunnels. We can put the IPv6 packets in IPv4 packets, but we will have the IPv4 header. Inside the IPv4 packet, we'll have an IPv6 packet, so we'll have an IPv6 header and usually a few things around. So that reduces uh, the maximum size. So here the idea is not, is not that people are imagining that we would develop bridges or ethernets or Wi-Fi cards that have smaller packet size, but it's because of possible encapsulation. Fragmentation is a bit like redistribution in BGP. It exists, but many systems and many people, like also the end-to-end -end principle, uh, we, uh, like intermediate gateways, we consider it harmful, so we would log, like to avoid it as possible. One of the reasons is the work that is imposed on all systems, and particularly routers. So network fragmentation forces the routers to do some work that, if can be avoided, will improve the performance of routers. So the obsession when you do routers is you might do real-time machines that are able to process packets at the speed of the lines. So any processing you have to do you, in the forwarding of packets, you want to avoid. There are other reasons which are, for example, that uh, in the past, one of the reasons for the internet congestion collapse was the absence of congestion control. But this was amplified by the fact that there was fragmentation that was done. If you send a TCP packet that is too large, and is fragmented into five pieces, for example. And if one of the pieces is lost, because reassembly will be done at the IP layer, the IP layer will try to reassemble the five segments, the five fragments, sorry. One of the five fragments is missing, so the fragmentation will fail. So you will have two effects. The first one is you will have delay. In order to know that the fragmentation fails, you need to wait long enough to be sure that all the fragments that may have followed different paths have been received. So you have to wait for a timeout, which is in the IP layer, in addition to the timeouts at the TCP layer. So it will increase the RTT for TCP, which is bad, as we know. And second, if you lose one of the fragments, for TCP, it's the same as losing the five fragments. 
because TCP will see no segment coming and will ask for retransmission of the entire segment. So there will be an amplification of the loss by losing a certain number of bytes. It is as if you had lost five times as many bytes, which makes the loss probability amplified and the congestion uh, even worse here. So in principle, you should avoid uh, fragmentation, and this is certainly done by TCP. So any TCP connection will try to avoid fragmentation. And the only way, and if it's for IPv6, we must, because we know that uh, the routers in the middle of the path will not fragment for us. Uh, so typically what is done, there are multiple ways. There is uh, different protocols, PMTUD, PLPMTUD. Uh, this is, I would say, the most commonly used protocol. Uh, the simplest thing to imagine is you try to send an IP packet. If the packet is too large, then well-behaved routers will respond with an ICMP error message saying, packet too large. So you send that back to the source. It's a bit like TTL exhausted that we have seen for trace route. The same thing can happen. If you receive such a message, you know your packet size was too large, you will decrease the packet size. And since you can be happy with a small number of five to six different packet sizes, then you can very quickly converge to something that works. Unfortunately, many routers don't do that. So routers that are in commercial backbone networks, for example, or routers that are in company networks like IBM, Google, etc., they don't send a lot of ICMP messages because they don't want to give too much information about themselves. And also they want to reduce uh, the work they have to do to be as fast and efficient as possible. So that works only if all the routers on the path do uh, send the ICMP messages. Uh, if not, then you might have loss of connectivity. If you send packets that are too large and nobody tells you that they are too large and they are dropped, then the connection doesn't work. So uh, the only safe way is this one. So what is done is that the TCP protocol itself tries to infer whether losses are correlated with a certain packet size. So once in a while, TCP will try to send packet size that are one notch larger than the current segment size it is using now, while still being below the maximum segment size advertised at connection setup. And if it sees that systematically, whenever I try to increase, this segment is lost, then it will infer that this is too large and will uh, go down here. So this is less safe than this. It would be better to have that, but since routers don't always cooperate, that's the only one that is done. And typically that means that when in the data associated with a TCP connection, we've seen that there's lots of things associated with a TCP connection. There is a reassembly buffer, a retransmission buffer, a, con a window size, uh, a congestion window size, uh, a slow start threshold or target window size if, we, if it's not equal to the congestion window size. In addition, there, are, there is also uh, a record of what is the path MTU. So you can go, for example, with NetSH. You can uh, see that for my machine here uh, over IPv6, you see that the path MTU, for example, is always 1500 for all the machines I was communicating with. So essentially what it means is for every TCP connection, your TCP will discover what is the max packet size and will uh, always send packets that are uh, not exceeding that packet size here. As I mentioned, UDP accepts packet datagrams that are larger. That's as a convenience to the programmer because the UDP service interface says that the block, the unit of data that I transfer to you is a message. So if, when you do a read from a TCP socket, if you succeed and get something, you know that's exactly the message that was sent by the source, which means you don't have to worry about finding boundaries of blocks and messages in the thing that you receive. And as we know, we have experimented that in the lab three, in TCP it's not the case. TCP might glue together several messages and you have to uh, have the application take care of where the boundaries are. So as a facility to that, we accept with UDP a datagram size that is independent of the network size, which means that it is fragmentation will have to be done and fragmentation has to be done at the source here.
little quiz to wrap up. out in five seconds. And the correct answer is 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 B. Most of the time it's true, except if there is fragmentation, which is possible even with IPv6. Uh, if the application generates a datagram that is larger than a UDP datagram, that is larger than the MTU of the interface, or even than the path MTU, if the host does a path MTU discovery to the destination, uh, then you, when you fragment a packet, I mean the the UDP port number is in the UDP header, which is at the beginning of the payload of the IP packet. So, of course, when you fragment it, you fragment the entire payload, which has the UDP port only at the number. So, the second fragment is just the second half of the packet, which doesn't contain the UDP header. So, it contains no port number. Which means if you try to interpret the port number by going to the place where there is a port number in UDP, which you can know it's at a given position, you will read a number because it's only bits, but this will not be the port number. So port numbers are present only in the first fragments. So if you have filtering routers that kill packets that have port numbers they don't like, they cannot kill the fragments. They can kill only the first port number, but not the second. But of course, it doesn't matter because at the destination, if the first fragment is killed, uh, the other fragments. Uh, I think there's a strong correlation between uh, the end of this lecture and noise uh, outside. Right? So that's a side effect of uh, fragmentation. Another last squeeze. Five seconds. And the correct answer is B, of course, as we have seen. And that's one of the motivations for forbidding fragmentation with TCP, obviously. 
second topic, IPv4 and IPv6 revisited. We've seen that there is this interworking problem, and we continue discussing interworking, but now with another solution. We've seen the first solution is application layer gateway. But another solution is NAT. After all, what is a NAT doing as we have seen it? A NAT is used primarily for IPv4 to hide the fact that we may have private addresses at home and that we may have more than one IP address on an interface that is visible to the rest of the world as one uh, IPv4 uh, address. Well, we can use the same principle by translating, an, instead of translating an IPv4 private address, we can translate an IPv6 address to an IPv4 address. Of course, that's a bit more than just translating because we also change the packet format, but the uh, principle is the same. So there is a form of NAT, which is called NAT64, which has the goal to allow a host that speaks only IPv IPv6 and that is connected only to the IPv6 internet to be able to talk to an IPv4 host. And to be honest, the system works well and easily if on the IPv6 we have a client and on IPv4 we have a server. We will discuss there are special things you need to do if that is not a pure client-server interaction. So the principle is, I mean, you are connected to the IPv6 internet, for example, because you have a mobile cellular service that is IPv6 only, and you want to go to a number of services that are uh, old style on the IPv4 internet. We've seen that, uh, and we want to avoid application layer gateway. Well, the idea is that your provider puts at the interface between the IPv4 internet and the IPv6 internet, it puts a NAT. Of course, it's going to be a much bigger NAT than the small NAT you have uh, at home. So the NAT will use the classical, the same thing, so that we know from NATs. It means at interface two, the NAT has an IPv4 block of addresses. At home, we have just one IPv4 address. Here, we will need more than one IPv4 address, so there is a block of addresses, but hopefully this block is much less than the number of clients, because if you had the same number as the number of clients, then you could give them IPv4 addresses and run IPv4 on this network. So, so we will do a lot of multiplexing of many IPv6 addresses to the same IPv4 address, but if we have one million customers here, one IPv4 address will not be sufficient. So we will need perhaps 10,000 IPv4 addresses. So it has what we, what we call the IPv4 address pool here. And the problem is now how to do the, the address translation. So to H6, the H, we need to do an address translation in two sides. H6, now it's a bit different than the pure NAT we had at home. When I am at home, uh, so if, you, if the pink thing is your private network, there is no translation from the public IP addresses to you. So when uh, somebody at EPFL server sends a packet to you at home, the source address is the address of the EPFL server. So it, here it doesn't work because this guy speaks only IPv6, so can receive only an IPv6 packet. So we need to have an IPv6, this, whole, this server has to appear under an IPv6 address. That's a new thing, a new difficulty, or it's not very difficult, but it's a new thing. That's what we call the IPv6 translated address, and similarly uh, to H6. So uh, that's the IPv4 translated ad address here, and similarly, of course, the, the client will appear as if it would be in the blue cloud, but that's the classical thing we have for NAT. Okay. <laughs> now, one of the address translation is as usual. So, translation from the IPv6 address to IPv4 translated address. So, IPv4 translated address is this one here. Uh, how is it done? So, let's see an example. So, here, this client sends a packet to uh, this guy. So the source address is the uh, IP address, IPv6 address of this guy. Now, 
it needs to send, uh, so sorry, so when the, this, so this, this is the address of H6, when it will be visible to H4, it will be something like this, so an IPv4 address, which belongs to the block of address here. Okay. How do we do that? Well, it's the usual way a NAT works. It is stateful, it means it needs to put the result, the mapping in a table. So whenever we see a packet like this for the first time, I'm still not explaining how, what, but what, how, how the packet finds its way, but when we see a packet at the NAT going in this way, we need to translate the source address, and to translate it, we take the next available combination of IPv4 addresses in this block here, and port numbers. So we change the port number, and we change the IP address, and because usually we don't use many, many port numbers, this is how we can multiplex a large number of sources into the same IP address here. And we call, and we need to remember, because when a packet will come in the IPv4 internet to that destination, we will need to remember to do the reverse translation. So it's called stateful, we need to have that in a table here. So that's business as usual. Now, the other side is easier, because in the other side, we have to translate the, so now I'm talking of the address under which this server appears to in the IPv6. So this one has a true IPv4 address, 192.0.2.1. Now when this guy sends a packet, it sends an IPv6 packet, so he needs to find the destination address, which is an IPv6 destination address. We did not have this problem in a NAT in a NAT 4.4 that we saw at the beginning, because the destination address was the regular IPv4 address. But here, uh, we need to translate it. Now, the problem is not difficult, because... Because of what? Because the, space, the IPv6 space is huge compared to the IPv4 space. So it's easy to take, reserve a block of IPv6 addressing space, and map all the IPv4 addresses to this subset. This is what is done. By default, you have a prefix, which is this one, 64FF9B. So 64, right? It's not 64. So 64FF9B, and as many zeros as necessary. That's a prefix that means anything that follows is in fact an IPv4 translated address. So what you do here, this part is simply the hexadecimal notation of this. In 192, you recognize C0, of course, and 021 gives 00201. So this is the, exactly the IPv4 address, and then we put a prefix, which means we have taken away a fraction of the IPv6 addressing space, but since it's so huge, we can do that, and do that plenty of times. So in some sense, there is uh, static address. So this block is by default uh, the one uh, that is reserved for this kind of mapping. Many ISPs don't want, want to have their own block because they don't want uh, that their own IPv6 to IPv4 NAT leaks to some other. They don't want to do the translation for another ISP. So many ISPs will pick their own block inside their IPv6 domain. But essentially it's the same. And now the operation is stateless, in the sense that when the NAT receives a packet with this destination address, it knows by analyzing the prefix, oh, that's a special IPv6 address. This is, I should not be forwarded inside the IPv6 internet. I should remove uh, the, the beginning of this block, the 96 first bits, take only the last 32 bits, create an IPv4 packet that has is copied from this, so it will copy from these things like the hop count. It will take the hop count that was here, will decrement it by one, and uh, map the source address by uh, looking what we saw in the previous slide, and then you will have a packet, uh, an IPv4 packet here. This is, in a nutshell, how the, uh, this NAT solution works. Quick check, how is the v4 address of the server 
translated to the V6 address by the NAT in the reverse direction. Close in five seconds. And of course it is algorithmic. So the the NAT when the NAT receives a packet here, it will simply do all the reverse mapping that we said before. It takes this address, adds the well known prefix, which by must be configured by the ISP that runs this NAT64, and uh, by default, if it uses the well-known prefix, it will add this. That's, if we uncompress, uh, we'll give this one. Yes? What about the? <coughs> no. Uh, well, we need to translate them because we need to translate, and uh, we need to translate unlike a traditional NAT, has to translate only one address. Now it needs to translate both and the port number. So the port number translation goes with the uh, translation uh, of, the, uh, of the destination here, right? The, desti the NAT will need to translate the from address and the to address. Okay. Yes? The translation from the IPv6 addresses to the IPv4 addresses is and port is done with this and the port numbers and is stateful. The reverse translation is stateless and does not affect the port number. Now, like before with Lisa or Bart accessing the application layer gateway, uh, how do we know that we have to go to the NAT, right? So I am a machine here. I go to a certain service like InfoScience EPFL.ch. Well, the same trick will be used. DNS can be used to say, well, instead of going direct via IPv6, you have to go to the NAT. So how do you do that? Well, if you have to go to a service like InfoScience.EPFL.ch, you go to the DNS. And the DNS, uh, should return, in fact, not the IP address of InfoScience, because InfoScience has only an IPv4 address. So if I go to DNS, the normal DNS, uh, that will not work. It will say to me simply uh, the communication is impossible. So if you deploy NAT64, you need also to deploy a special DNS server, or in your DNS server, you need to make sure that you have changed the record. For example, all the records for which uh, that are A records only are responded to with the mapped translated address of the service. So when this guy asks, what is the IP address of this service? It will receive an IPv6 address which is 64 ff 9 b etc. And this translation can be done only by DNS. But of course, it will not be done by the standard DNS infrastructure. It has to be with a DNS infrastructure associated with the NAT, which means that this host has to be configured with the correct DNS server. If you go to Google's DNS server that does not provide the NAT64 service, and you run this over your mobile phone that is uh, running China, Chinacom Mobile, for example, uh, that won't work. You have to go to the DNS server of the operator that will put the correct prefix here in front of this. Right? 
And if this is well uh, coordinated, then the good news is that it's completely transparent to the client here. At least as long as the client is, um, is talking to a server and not the other way around. So if we put things together, we see that whenever this guy goes to any service, it goes always via DNS. If the service is an IPv4 only, it will get an IPv4 translated, uh, an IPv6 address, which is an IPv4 translated address. It will create a packet to that destination address. And so for this guy, everything lives in an IPv6 world. Then this packet will be translated to the correct address. This is now algorithmic. The from address will be the NAT thing. So in this direction, the from address IPv6 and port number will be translated to an IPv4 address and another port number, which you need to remember in the reverse direction. So let me skip this one. This works only in one direction. If now you have the opposite, somebody on the IPv4 internet wants to access your service, this thing will not work. You need to make a static, because of we have this, uh, the classical problem, if you have a server at home behind your NAT, then the address of your server will not visit, be visible to the rest of the world. So you need a trick. One of the tricks is to configure your NAT statically with the address of the server, and you publish somewhere in the DNS uh, uh, another address here. So similar tricks can be played here, but they require some configuration. One thing that is even worse is the true peer-to-peer -peer application. Do you know some true peer-to-peer -peer application? A legal one. <laughs> Skype. Yeah. Skype or IP telephony, where you, if you don't want, don't want to go to buy an intermediate server, which those systems will try as much as possible to avoid, we establish a connection directly between two hosts. And so you need to be able to call someone here. So that will not work. So operators that deploy IPv6 only internet on mobile systems typically have to, sub to provide dedicated support for Skype, for um, other um, voice over IP application here. So they need uh, some way to solve this uh, client server in the wrong direction here, which typically comes in the case of Skype by having a dedicated Skype service associated with the system. Okay. Voilà, that was our second uh, way of interworking IPv4 and IPv6. Next week we'll see uh, a third one, which has to do with uh, an easier way, with uh, tunnels, which are the things we used in the lab in the room INF019. We have an IPv6 access to internet, which is over IPv4, because we have only IPv4 connectivity in that room. We'll see next week how we support that. Right now we will see a small funny hack, which is called proxy ARP. Remember that IP principle says one subnet is one LAN. Now assume you want to cheat, right? So for example, here I have here uh, a subnet 12.12.12 slash .12 .12 24. And for some reason I put, I put a machine here, which is in the wrong place, right? Well, in principle, that won't work. Uh, but with the internet, everything is always complicated a bit. If we start looking at the exemptions, there is always a way to make it work. Uh, now, assume this is the, the correct place. So those interfaces are configured with this network mask. Then what would happen if there is a packet uh, that comes here for this destination? Then what will the IP forwarding algorithm do? Well, it will try to find by looking at the routing table what are all the prefixes. In principle, it will not work, except if you do what is called a special prefix, which is longer than this one, which is, in fact, an address equal to a prefix. And because IP does longest prefix match, it will match this thing here. This is called sometimes a host route. It's like you can code in your routing table an exception that says, for this specific host, go to in this direction. In fact, you can also inject that in, in the routing protocols. Yeah, so you can have host routes that are 
communicate to the internet. So if you correctly do it in R2 and say, for this host route, go to the interface on the right, ETH1 instead of ETH0, that would be on the left, then a packet to that destination will not stay, will not do ARP and all that stuff, but will go on this interface. And at R3, you can do the same thing here by saying it's on link on this interface here. So you can manipulate this uh, by uh, properly configuring uh, the things here. Uh, so this is an example of what is done here when you access, for example, of a, some kind of VPN over modem lines, so less and less used, but in emergencies uh, you, can, you can still run it. So assume you want to access EPFL over a dial-up line and you obtain an EPFL address. This is a router and the address that you see is the address that is the, uh, belongs to the prefix of the subnet on which the router is on the EPFL side, which is also the same here. So we have here again a deviation. We have a router that has two interfaces and normally the way if we follow the textbook uh, about IP, we said we should allocate a different prefix to this line. But in practice, we don't want to give this because on this line, there's only one interesting end. So only, we win only one address. So we don't want to configure one prefix per line, but there's only one guy at the other end. So we cheat and we say, we pretend it belongs to this. We give to those guy addresses that are here. So we've done something wrong. So like before, we need host routes. To, we need to put a host route in this router. So whenever there's a packet that goes to this destination, it will go to this router here. But uh, there will be another problem, which is uh, about HARP, uh, about if we don't want to configure all routers, when a packet to this destination comes at this router, right? If we don't want to do the trick that we did before, which is to configure host routes everywhere in the world, uh, in particular not in this router, but only in this, because that's a VPN type of machine. You want to configure it. You accept to configure it, but you don't want it to play with the routing protocol of EPFL. It's just a machine, not a full-fledged router. So when a packet comes here, if we have not modified the configuration of this one to this address, what will it do? What will ED0X do? Well, it will analyze the destination address and will say, oh, it's on my subnet. Therefore, it will do, it will put it here, by, and it will do ARP, right? It will ask, what is the MAC address corresponding to this? Now, there are two problems with that. I mean, the first one is perhaps this does not even have a MAC address. If it's just a dial-up line, there is no MAC address on this. That's a minor problem. You can always add a MAC address if there is none. But the second problem is nobody will respond to the ARP, so it will not work. Well, this is what proxy ARP was invented for. Proxy ARP means this machine, that is the one that has done the violation, will do a second violation, which consists in saying, whoops, whenever there is an ARP to this address, that one will respond, and it will respond with its own MAC address. So it's cheating. Uh, perhaps it's serving 100 such devices. For each of those 100 devices, when somebody does an ARP, who has the MAC address corresponding to this? This guy will respond, it's me, and will give its MAC address. And now it will work because the Ethernet packet destination address will be this machine. This machine will receive the packet. Now, because it's a VPN server, it's configured to do the right thing. It will receive the packet, and it has the configuration to know what to do with it. This is called proxy ARP, and that's a trick uh, that is often used whenever the configuration of the different machines, the prefixes, the prefix configuration are not consistent. Voila. And on this uh, fairly distressing uh, uh, violations, uh, we will conclude for today. See you tomorrow and next week.